I'm your host, Marlo Lemon, and you're listening to Wild Voice, the podcast where I take this voice of mine and share my wild journey with you. Being widowed at 34 with a 15-month-old, most would see as life ending. And instead, I alchemized it and put life back together. And it became more beautiful and fulfilling than I could have ever imagined. Through this life shift of mine, I realized who I am and what I'm here to do. I'm an intuitive energy healer, and sharing how I view the world is how I help you upgrade your life and alchemize your journey into magic. From day one, I wanted to share my journey, call it intuition, but I knew it was going to do more good out in the world than keeping it to myself. So when I say I've mastered life, that doesn't mean I'm perfect, or that life is. I mean I've mastered the concept of life, and I want to share that with you. Hello, everyone. So today's episode is the Q&A episode. I have gotten a bunch of your questions, and I want to answer them for you. Now, a couple of them are very similar, and you'll find that I kind of lump them together because they have obviously similar answers. So if you don't hear your question specifically, that is why, but let's just get right into it. Um, Something that I noticed right off the bat as I was getting feedback from you guys, uh, you know, after these eight episodes had dropped and even during that process is how much you guys have resonated and not only taken parts of this story and applied it to your own life, but also those of you that know the people in this story, whether you're close to me or we're close to Bob or know Nash or know my family or friends, the fact that you have this newfound appreciation and understanding for not only myself and Nash and those of us that were kind of going through this, but the people that were there for me. And that's just something I didn't anticipate and how magical it is to see that it not only gave you insight to my life and how I was moving through this and Nash, but you got this appreciation and this understanding for those that are the closest to us and were during all of this. So that is just something that's been really amazing to see. And I appreciate all of the feedback and the comments and the little notes and messages. So keep them coming. So I'll start with a handful of questions that I got about Bob's family. So the first one, how does Bob's family feel about you sharing his story? And are you still in touch with them? How have they reacted to your podcast? So I was actually surprised that so many people had this similar question. So I'm glad I get an opportunity to share this with you. So Bob's family, they have been very supportive and very understanding and very gracious with how they're allowing me to move through this process. It's not necessarily their way of doing things and, you know, kind of putting it all out there, but they are very supportive that this is my journey and my process. So I will say that as far as if I'm in touch with them, yes, absolutely. They are still a part of my family. They still are my family as well as Nash's. So we will always be in touch with them. They will always hold a special place in our heart and we are very close to them. We don't get to see them as much as we want, but that's life. That's like with people living all over. Um, that happens regardless. So yes, we are still in touch with them and how they've reacted to the podcast. Um, the close, there's a close group that I sent the podcast out the first handful of episodes before I released them. Um, that was something I always had in the back of my mind that I wanted to do. It was something that felt right. And this is, they were very close to it as well. So I wanted to respect that and then, you know, let them know that this was going to be happening. And then also let them hear it before it started rolling out and other people were hearing it first. Um, And they're very appreciative of that. And I can't say enough amazing things about them. And Nash and I will always be close to them. Another question in regards to Bob's family has been, did any of them ever have an inclination to anything that was going on? Um, And Like the rest of us, we were all very shocked and taken back. I can't say I've crossed paths with anyone who said that they had any sort of um, idea that this was happening or any sort of awareness of what Bob was struggling with or dealing with. Um, None of that. 
So I can speak for all of us very confidently and say we were all very shocked and all in the same boat um, of not having any idea that this was going on. Um, Another question about Bob's family was specifically about their reactions. And I want to preface this and say I have so much respect and love for his family. And they are still a part of my family, like I said, as Nash's. And I'm not going to speak for them. And they didn't sign up for this, you know, so their responses, I, I'm not going to share, but I will tell you that they are very supportive. They're very kind. And when it comes to my process, they are very much so in my and Nash's corner. Um, so I will say that and um, we'll leave it at that. Did you find out who gave Bob HIV and did you ever get any of those answers? So I did not find out whoever um, or wherever it was contracted from specifically. Um, Anyone who reached out to me, I did let them know so that they had an idea or they knew to get tested themselves. Um, Other than that, I did not um, dive into that any further, and nor did I get information of people telling me specifically um, that they contracted it from him or he might have contracted it from them. (laughs) <laughs> this one made me laugh a little bit. Can you talk to dead people? So, so I think this person was obviously a serious question, but it's funny because I think there's this idea. So I'm going to explain this in a couple parts. So medium, mediums, those are people that have the ability to speak with people that have passed on. And there are people that are very skilled in this. Some people um, are just born with it. Most people are just born with it. And then you have learned ways to perfect it and practice it. And some people are just born with it and they just know innately what to do. So for me, when I would speak to mediums um, after Bob passed away, that was something that felt like a peace to me. It was something that felt comforting. So I understand why people do it. I understand why it's part of their healing process and why it's comforting because I went through that process myself. As far as when I have sessions with people, My sessions are a little different and they're very intentional in the fact of we're dealing with whatever is going on in the moment, healing through that, even if we're working through healings and energy work through past traumas or present traumas, and also very much forward focused. So if someone I'm having a session with asks to speak to someone or asks a question from someone that has passed on, I can access and give them some information. In the energetic world, there are a lot of rules. And even though there it's equally there aren't any rules, there are these energetic rules that if you don't want certain things in your space, there are things you can do to protect that. And when I'm in sessions with people, I am not rigid about much, really with anything in my life, but I am very rigid in the space that I protect and the information that I'm pulling from. And mine is always source driven and insert whatever you believe in for that word. For me, that's what I call a higher power. So when I'm in sessions with people, I am connecting to source, pulling that sort of information and from the client's higher self. Those are the two things that are important to me to help someone heal and move forward. And the reason that is, is because source and the higher self sees things from from a bird's eye view and with the intention that it's always with the highest good in mind. Now, if someone has a question about someone who has passed on, I can access that information for them and get little bits here and there. It is not my strong suit. It is not my thing. So I would normally, if someone was really interested in that sort of work, I would refer them to a friend of mine. And as far as why that is for me specifically, to just touch on that a little bit more, think of it this way. So if you have, let's say, I'll use my example. So Bob, let's say I had a question and I wanted to um, someone to help me connect with him and just make me feel a little bit more comforted and hear what he had to say, or did he know this or this or that or questions, whatever it might be. I can ask someone those things and hear those and get what I need from that, right? If I'm specifically in a session with someone as myself and working on a healing session, And I'm trying to help them move through something or find their soul pull or work through a relationship or um, shift out a dynamic that they're in or boost their self-love. All of these things are forward motion things. 
So when I'm asking questions, I'm asking questions from a place of what's going to help them get to where their soul is most aligned the quickest and in the most effortless way. So if I have someone that wants to ask someone who has passed on, so let's say myself, for example, if I want to ask Bob a question like, do you think I should have Nash um, go to this specific school? Let's say that was a question and I was working with a medium. The understanding that I have with that is that whoever that soul was when they were here are the same one you're connecting with when you're working with a medium. So if you have someone that's very opinionated or they had certain specific things that were important to them um, and you ask them a question, you're almost getting their opinion. You're not necessarily getting information that is in the highest good for everyone involved. So this is the reason why when people want more mediumship work that I would refer them to someone else because it doesn't necessarily align with the work that I do with people in sessions, but there is a purpose for it. For me, it's a purpose for comfort. It's to get some questions answered. If that feels like that resonates to you, it's not necessarily something to ask what you should do with your life. Same thing as if you had like an opinionated grandma and she passed on and you wanted to ask her if the person you were with, you know, was the right fit or if you should marry them. You're going to get grandma's response, like how she was. So if she was loud and boisterous and was very specific on what she liked and didn't like, you're going to get that answer. So if that's comforting to you, then that's wonderful as far as moving forward and like what's the best plan of action for you going forward. That wouldn't be where I would ask my questions. Okay, that was a long winded answer, but I want to help kind of explain that because there is a purpose for it. To me, it's just not the place where I ask specific questions um, because they're more like opinions. Okay. How to support our kids and how to learn more about them as individuals and their journey with us as their parents. So this one I love because something that has been in the back of my mind for quite some time is creating an environment and ways to explain certain dynamics to kids. Obviously, I'm getting experience with that with Nash. So something I would say just off the top of my head on how to support kids and how to help them learn and become individuals themselves is trusting them. The other thing is, is talking to them like they're adults. Now, I know there's certain verbiage and I know there's probably certain topics that get watered down a little bit, but if you take the root and the concept of what is going on for an adult and break that down so a kid can understand it, these are amazing conversations to have with them. Because what you're showing is, one, you're showing them that you trust them and that you you know that they understand. Because they understand big concepts. I think a lot of adults think that kids just can't grasp certain things. They might not be able to put words to them, but they're extremely intuitive. Most kids from the age of like two and three to seven are the most intuitive beings that you will ever come across. That's why you notice they're most time the happiest. And most of the time they do what they want to do. And most of the time they're very honest. It's because they don't know any different. So they are very led intuitively. And then around seven is when they start to kind of change and notice like what's normal, what should they be doing, what gets a reaction and what doesn't. So there's a developmental stage and shift that happens around seven. So the more we can support that intuitive understanding for them and nourish that, the better off they are and more trusting they are of themselves, let alone their environments and the experiences they come across. So supporting them. Talking to them like they're adults, giving them big concepts for their, you know, developing brains to wrap their head around. And then I would also say being human. So there have been so many times that I have in the beginning, not hidden from Nash, but tried to shield him from something I was going through or seeing me sad or whatever that might be, or asking me, let's say if I was in the car and my eyes got teary eyed or I got quiet or my voice cracked when I was talking to him and he picked up on that and he would say something to me like, mom, what's wrong? Are you okay? Most of us to shield our kids and think that they don't need to deal with certain things like adult problems. We would say, "Uh, everything's fine. I'm fine. What we've just done is actually here. We think we're helping, which is understandable. But what I've just done then is I've just told my kid that their intuition isn't right and their intuition isn't accurate. And that feeling they picked up on 
that something was wrong, I'm actually telling them that was inaccurate. But it really wasn't, right? They picked up on that something was wrong because they're very intuitive and connected. And I can give him opportunities or give our kids opportunities to nurture that, or I can start getting him to not trust himself. And the more I tell him when he picks up on something that it's not right, when it is, the more I'm teaching him and feeding him that he can't trust himself and what he's picking up on. So, for example, when Nash asks me something like that, and let's say it's obvious that there's something is wrong, I would say, you know what? You totally picked up on that right. I'm feeling sad. I'm feeling frustrated. I'm feeling this. Or, you know what? You totally picked up on that something's wrong. I don't really know what it is yet, but thank you for noticing. We can tell them things and be honest without giving them our problems to deal with. But we can give them that little check that yes, their intuition was right. That feeling that they got was spot on. Okay, this is a this is a good one. So when you have human moments where things seem out of control or you're overstimulated, can you explain how you bring yourself back down to homeostasis? Can you explain your mental and physical process? So this is a big one. So this one could probably be its whole uh, its own episode. But I'm just going to touch on this um, and see how I want to share this with you guys. So my human moments, most of the time, my human moments are geared in emotion. So mastering emotions is really big for me. And that is something actually I'm learning more about and taking more classes on now and reading more books about, because this is something that's extremely fascinating to me that over the years and all of my healing, emotions for all of us seem to be this big pivotal point. It seems to be the thing that either helps us or hurts us. And it actually is always helping us, but depending on how we move through it and what we take from it is whether or not it's uncomfortable or painful during that process. So I would say in my human moments, I get really clear on what the emotion is. I get clear on what it at what I'm actually even having a human moment about because a lot of the times we'll notice it's not really the thing we're upset about. So for example, if I'm super irritated that someone's not calling me back, okay? And I think it's that person that's making me mad and I'm out of control in the sense of I don't have control whether they call me back or not and it just like spirals this frustration. Well, really, Is it really that they're not calling me back or is it this feeling that I have a lack of control or is it a feeling that I'm not being acknowledged or is it a feeling that I'm being ignored? So I get really clear on what it is and I have those human moments, what it is that really is at the root of that. And then if I am feeling overstimulated, my next question will be intuitively, I'll ask myself, and this is something anyone can do. You can ask yourself out loud. You can think it. What will help me bring down this emotion in this moment? Now, that doesn't mean you're solving it. It doesn't mean you're taking it off the table or ignoring it. What it means is, is to be able to think clearly and for me to actually get balanced and figure out the next best step and to help myself feel better. I have to get clear first. So I need to ask, what is it that's going to, it might be go for a walk. It might be go to the gym. It might be read a book. It might be go get your nails done. It could be work for 20 minutes. It could be anything. Go to lunch with a friend. Ask yourself what is going to bring down my emotion in this moment so that I can get back to balance to then go back in to tackle it. Then the next thing would be once I do that thing, you'll find a lot of the time you'll get the answer or the release during that moment. So you might be driving to lunch to meet up with a friend and you'll get the idea that you know is going to snap you out of it. Or you might be working out and all of a sudden you're realizing what it was really about and how quickly you can shift it. So that those are things I start to do. Emotions sit and you have to move them. So whether that's moving your hands and building something, moving your mind by reading, you know, moving your physical body by like running, um, changing your environment, even something as simple if you're in one room, getting up and moving to another room, changing the space around you and just motion helps, you know, move emotion that then allows you to see it clearer. Because when we're like batshit crazy and our emotions are like at a 10, there's no way we're going to come up with a, a great solution. We're pretty much just setting things on fire right and left. So the best thing to do is get clear on what it actually is. And then the next step is to figure out how we can do something to help just neutralize and bring us down for a second 
so we can go back in and tackle what's really going on. And again, this can be a whole episode because then the next steps of actually tackling what's going on has its own set of like flipping the scenario and also letting the emotion cycle through. So I'll do an episode on this. Okay, who are the girls? (laughs) So for the sake of this podcast and the things that I talk about, I don't use many people's names. And that's just because that hasn't been something people have requested. It's just something I've chosen to do. So the girls, I will just tell you, they are a group of my college friends and there are four of them. And we have been friends since day one, since we were freshmen. Now, four, is it three, four, five of us total. So three of them, did I get that right? Yeah. Three of them were in my sorority. So Kappa Kappa Gamma. And then one other one, we called her an honorary Kappa, kind of like how we did Bob. She was always around. She was a part of our group. She actually didn't live in the house, obviously. So she had a place outside of our sorority, which was the best place for parties. So she was the perfect little honorary Kappa. Um, So that's who they are. We've been we've been friends since day one. That's like what now age myself, like almost 20 years. And these were the girls. A lot of people, you know, came in to support. But these were the girls that were on the front lines with me. Um, while this was all happening and their families. Have you been able to connect with other wives that share a similar journey as yours? So in the next question, I'll just add this one in because it's very similar. Have you met other, other women or families who have gone through the same thing? So I'm hoping with this podcast, part of the idea was that people could hear this and understand and either share it with people who are going through similar things or someone will hear it and feel less alone or someone will hear it and have the desire or interest in connecting. And I would love to have people that have gone through similar experiences or have journeys similar to this or even on either end, whether that is the, you know, the wives in these relationships or the men. Because the thing that I always knew going into this and when I decided this was something I wanted to share was the fact that this is happening. It's not just to me, right? I'm very aware of that. What I, I, what I do know is rare is people actually choosing to share it because it is a very vulnerable thing. It is very intense. It, is, it does have a stigma to it. And when you have kids involved, I think other people choose to stay anonymous for that reason. And a lot of the times their spouses are still living. And so they have a different dynamic. They have a different understanding. So they have a different routine. So that's a lot of the pieces on why... I wanted to share it in this way to allow that outlet for people that do want to stay anonymous, but that also know there is someone else out here that welcomes that conversation and that connection. So I'm, my hope is with this podcast and as people learn about it and hear about it, that people will want to be a part of this and that I get to help them share their stories as well. So I look forward to that being a thing down the road that I do get to connect with families and wives and men that have gone through this similar experience. What are the gifts of your experience? This one is amazing. And obviously I could talk about this for hours, days even probably. The gifts, I would say there are so many, but one of the biggest ones that then catapulted everything else, I would say, is the understanding of myself and what this forced me to do And start from ground zero and build that foundation back up and figure out who I was. Because without doing that first, everything else is just putting band aids on things. So if I hadn't gone through something like this and I was kind of trying to figure my way, it probably would have taken me a whole lot longer. And I don't know that I would have gotten to the completion of where I've gotten now and in the amount of time. So to me, the biggest gift is that I got to not only learn how to heal myself, find the support team around me and figure out who I was. Cause then that was the catalyst to everything else. Once I figured out that I could be the mom that I needed to be for Nash and that he deserved. I could be the friend and you know, the daughter and this, you know, the sister and the girlfriend and all of these things and find that career and that passion and Just be that person, even in passing and in acquaintances with people. Once I figured out who I was, everything else started to flow. 
So to me, that is the biggest gift that I was able to be given the opportunity to find that again. Owning your own future, not just as a mom, but a woman. Thoughts on how starting that process or finding that soul pull. So owning your own future is something that, again, comes with more understanding of ourself. The more I understood myself, the more I understood my future was something that would play out naturally. I didn't have to force it. So being a mom was something and a single mom, that was something that added a different layer to it. But to be honest, I don't know much different because I started this journey with Nash as a single mom when he was 15 months old. So to be honest, I don't know much of a different version of this and being a mom. So for me, it just is what it is. But as far as trying to make space for that, I will say as things get busier and Nash becomes more evolved and more questions and needing more of my attention in a different way, I will say finding that balance and finding that sweet spot is something that is a little clumsy for a little bit. And it really just takes that innate grounding of what the real long-term, you know, picture looks like. So it's always important for me to make sure I take care of myself because I can't be there for Nash if I am not doing good on my own. So that's really important. And sometimes that's hard to do, especially when we're pulled in a million different directions. So staying really focused on making sure I check in with me and make time for that, even if that's as simple as I drop him off at school and I go do something fun or I go take a nap or go back to bed for, you know, an hour or whatever it is or start working right away. You know, whatever that might be, I get really clear and focused on that and I don't let that slip very long. And for me now, it gets very uncomfortable if I ignore things like that that are now part of my foundation. So it's pretty obvious when things get out of alignment. Most people from the outside probably wouldn't notice, but for me, it's extremely uncomfortable. So staying really clear on getting in alignment with myself and what feels good for me and then also making sure that I have that that I'm feeding things that feel good to my soul. So that's going to be my career and my vocation and what I was put here to do. The second piece to that is when I do those things, Nash naturally leans into that ebb and flow, whatever our dynamic is. So that's the nice part to know that once those pieces get locked in, other things still have their, you know, tough spots, but it has a different flow to it. So the next piece to that would be Finding that balance with having kids or a kid or being a single parent or co-parenting with somebody, whatever that looks like, then understanding that next piece and saying, okay, where can I make sure this is all balanced where no one feels like they're, you know, being left out. So that is a huge thing. And I think as a mom, I can relate to that and say that it just takes some time and it just takes awareness. And I also like to help Nash and give him independence. And that really helps. The more independence we give our kids, the more they trust themselves and get practice at knowing that they can do things instead of us just throwing them out there on their own one day and being like, okay, figure it out. We actually are giving them that knowing with us still here in their corner. And what that does is that allows to take the pressure off of us. It also lets them see and get practice at doing things on their own and kind of tripping and falling and doing their own sort of thing in kind of these little, this little safety bubble. So that would be my thoughts on how you start that process. As far as finding your soul pull and what that is, that thing that lights you on fire, the thing that you were put here to do, it is much more simple than it sounds. That to me is sitting down in a session, intuitively checking in, checking in with someone's higher self with source. Boom, boom, boom. These are a couple of questions. Here we go. And then we know exactly what that is. To me, it's one of the most magical things and oddly, one of the easier things to figure out with someone. It's just a lot of us aren't really taught how to look for that because we are more taught of kind of all the things we should do, the things we need to do. You need to pay your bills. You need to do this. You need to do that. And yes, we are living in a human environment. These are things to survive that we need to kind of mesh into our life and be aware of. But we're focusing a lot of the times on the end result. And it's not necessarily the thing that's going to get us to the most fulfilled life and the most success, whatever that looks like to you, whatever that feels like to you, that's ultimately what our souls want, that fulfillment 
and that success and that freedom and that safety. So to me, finding those, that balance and then intuitively checking in and getting those certain questions answered and nailing that soul pull, everything else kind of starts to open up. This one's more of like a comment, but I think it's worth sharing. So someone had said, you've opened my eyes and changed my perspective on suicide. I'm grateful for that. So that is just, it warms my heart because the reason why there's so many reasons on why I'm doing this podcast and sharing my story, but suicide is such an intense topic. It is something that is such, you know, people cringe when they hear it. I'm sure when I just said it, it kind of made you feel a certain way. It's a scary thing to people. And if there is anything that I can do or anything that I've shared that gives any little piece of perspective or help in kind of softening this kind of normalized thing that happens, I'm really grateful for that. So thank you um, for sharing that. And I'm just so glad I could be, if even a little small part, on why that's looked at a little differently. How can you be so calm, positive, and collected? So I have my human moments. So by any means, I don't want anyone to think that I just kind of, you know, walked through the fires blazing, you know, with (laughs) my hands in namaste. So I definitely had my moments. But I will say that the second this happened, it's like a, a light switch changed. And it's not like it went off or on. If anything, I'd probably say it turned on. And it just That's how I knew that this was supposed to be my story. This was supposed to be my process. It happened to me because I was going to be the one sharing it because it's just how I approached it. Again, I, I didn't know any different on how to respond to this. So it's not surprising to me on how I'm delivering it. It's just how it is. So the only thing I can say is that this is innately me. And so that's why it comes across that way, or if it feels calm and positive and collected, it's because not only have I decided I wanted to share this, so I'm, you know, talking about it has been very easy for me naturally. Um, being vulnerable about it has come very naturally. Um, so I guess I would just have to say that it aligned so much with what I was supposed to do or am supposed to do that it just is pretty natural and more effortless than you would think. So it's not something I had to put a lot of thought into. Um, I do have my moments of processing, like when certain episodes would come out, there were these kind of like little moments of, you know, not ever wanting it to not be shared, but just being like, ooh, I didn't know that that would feel that way. Or I didn't know this would be the part that I would, you know, wonder what people thought about. And so I do have my human moments, but I very quickly will turn them around and see, yeah, but this is, you're supposed to be doing this. This is you. This is why this is coming out, you know, in such a fluid manner, because it is just aligned with my soul. And if I can explain anything to you guys, things that feel doesn't mean they're easy, but they have this ease to them and they just are natural. That is when you know that you are lining up with things that are very soul driven. And if I can give you any example of that, that would be something that comes a little bit more effortless, not perfect or easy, but just that ease to it. Okay. These next couple questions, I find them, what's the word? Perfect timing. I'll say, because these next few ones are about Nash and kind of how I'm explaining this to him and kind of specifics on that. And funny enough, this last, I want to say couple weeks, maybe month, but for sure this week, I've been getting a lot of questions from Nash trying to wrap his head around what our life looks like. And I anticipated this time when this happened, you know, four years ago, because now he's almost six. And I anticipated this time, but I think for some reason I expected it to be a little different, but because my life works in the way that it does, Most of the time, the things I'm going through in my own personal life tend to be things I end up sharing with other people or I end up learning and kind of like, you know, gaining information on and practicing and and applying so then I can then share them with you guys. So it's no coincidence that these questions are coming up today and and that this week has been kind of a big one 
working through this with Nash. So I'll answer this in both aspects, kind of how I handled it then and kind of how it's evolved now. So it says, explain how you've processed and shared this with Nash over the years and continue to. So in the beginning, Nash, when he would ask me, it was he would bring up a picture or he would bring up his name or he'd say Dada and like, look at me like with a question. And I would tell him. Of course, I talked to multiple people before I would would figure out what felt right to me. I would talk to healers. I talked to my therapist and then I came up with what felt right. And so when he would ask me, I would say that daddy died and he is in heaven, but he lives in our heart. And it was kind of this repeat that I would just have on repeat. So every time he would bring me the picture and ask me, and the reason why that was, is I wanted him to know the truth, right? He did die. I wasn't going to hide that from him. And I also wanted him to know that he was in another place. And I also wanted him to have something tangible because kids need something tangible, even adults. When we, when something is very, that's why a lot of these spiritual teachings and energy work, I have to give stories or examples or relate them to something that we have seen in a tangible form, because it's really hard for us to grasp that if we don't have a lot of training on that, to grasp something we can't see. Now, there are things we just understand, right? Like, you know, that just because we don't live in the same town, you know, I still exist. So it's that same concept, but in a more, you know, intense level. We get those concepts. So I try and take that and wrap that into something more intense and emotional like this. So with him knowing that he did die, that he is in heaven and that he um, lives in his heart. What that did is that gave him somewhere that was a part of him to still access Bob. So it was a combo of all the things to get his brain to kind of calm down, something repetitive and something that then he would start to repeat. And it took a little bit. But he eventually then would people he would when I would go to say it to him, he would finish my sentence or when he started going to preschool and people would ask where his dad was or things like that. He would repeat that to them. So that worked for a bit. And it was actually probably the easiest part. And I think I expected it to be different. I expected it to be harder in the beginning. And I would have to say that it's probably harder the hardest, probably the last couple of years, but it ebbs and flows, right? It's not a constant. It'll be like a moment or like a blip. And I'd say right now it's, we're pretty much in the thick of it because now he's starting to ask pretty specific questions. And I knew it was changing when I want to say it was maybe a year or two ago, he started asking me questions on how did he die and why did he die? Because the reason why he started asking those and being more curious is because obviously developmentally, he started to understand more. He started to be around, you know, in a school environment where that is really where he started to see what families, you know, specifically look like. And that's what he was gauging it off of. And um, so with that, the next piece of that was our dog, Alvin, who was, I had him for 15 years and he died um, only about two years ago. So Nash was three or four at the time. And so he was very aware of Alvin and he was very aware that one day he was there and he wasn't doing very well. And then all of a sudden he was gone. So he had death to relate to in that way, which then I think kind of triggered this whole other understanding of like, oh, this is what that is. Someone's here, then they're not doing well. And then all of a sudden they're gone. So he started relating a lot of those questions to that. And in case this is ever helpful for anyone who has an animal that passes away. What I found was helpful for that specific scenario is he saw Alvin and then he saw saw him gradually start to not, you know, move as well or would have accidents in the house or would not hear as well. So he'd like Nash would trip over him because Alvin wouldn't move out of the way Um, or he'd move really slow and we'd have to help him down the stairs. So he started to gradually see that with time and age his body was starting to change. Now, it's very different than the Bob scenario, but to give you an idea. So when that started to happen, that was really tough for me because it brought up all these other feelings. So when I had to start, when I knew that Alvin was going to have to be put down when it got to that point and Nash was going to school, I had to start preparing him to understand that Alvin's body stopped working. And that's what happened to him. 
and give him those examples. But I had to be very specific because then I didn't want him to think just because a body part doesn't work or is hurt or we're sick, that that means someone dies or something dies. So it's this very like fine line of giving them information, but also not letting them attach it to this big concept. So the idea was that all of Alvin's body parts stopped working and that took him a lot of years. And in dog years, he was like almost a hundred years old. So I related that to told Nash about that when like people get older, there's a certain cycle of life and this is what happens and you know, this and that. So he started to grasp what death was when Alvin died. So that's when another set of questions started coming up and he would ask me if then, so that meant his, his dad was really old and he died. So I had to kind of reframe that and say, no, that wasn't the case. You know, he had certain body parts that weren't connecting and that's what created an accident. And just, you know, I didn't say decisions. I said, this would have created an accident and then he'd leave it at that. And also the other thing is that if you say accident to kids, when they hear that someone has an accident or if someone has something that happens, but you know, they think they're say a car accident, they instantly go to that. So you, again, it's a very fine line. And so when he started to ask me more specific questions, that was when it started to get a little bit more tough because his, his intuition, his soul, his understanding was getting that he wasn't getting information that was landing and sticking and making him feel like, okay, I'm going to stop asking questions. So he'd keep asking. So I needed to find something that would be a little bit more that would resonate with him more and kind of help him ease off. And what I found was helpful again with my own understanding of him and experience and healers and therapists. What the understanding was and what I told him was that his dad for a really long time, like really long time, did not take care of himself. And what happened was, is he didn't take care of himself and he didn't talk very nice to himself. And he was really hard on himself for a really, 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 really long time, like years and years and years, and maybe his whole life. So by the time he got older, his mind and his soul and his body weren't thinking the same. And he got that and he understood that. And what I was doing in the same at the same time as I was help giving him a lesson and an understanding is that it's always important to take care of ourselves. Now, the part that now is coming up and that I feel like he's now starting to push for more information is it's not so much about what happened to Bob or why he's gone, which is its own set of things that I'm working on. And I'm going to share that with you guys as I start to come up with the ways I I joke with people and say when I'm creating new concepts or figuring out new ways to work through things, it's kind of like my brain or like papers in my house or a certain section um, in my room kind of looks like detective work. Like you'll see a piece of paper here with notes, piece of paper here, like a red string attaching it to this, you know, markers pointing to this. Like it takes some time for me to wrap my head around these concepts and figure out the best way and kind of trial and error. So I'm going to share this with you guys in an episode as I start to kind of hone that in. But right now, the biggest thing is, is he's talking a lot about what a dad is. And he's saying he misses his dad and wants him here and is frustrated that he's not here. That was something he said to me the other day. He said he's, he was frustrated with himself about something and I could tell that wasn't what the thing was. And so I said, does this have to do with you uh, with, about your dad? And he looked at me and he cried and he started nodding his head. Yes. So what he was telling me and what I was picking up on was that this frustration, again, like I spoke earlier about, it wasn't necessarily about not being able to like buckle his seatbelt, although that can be frustrating. Imagine trying to buckle your seatbelt and just not getting your hands to work the way you want them to. So that is frustrating in itself, but it was really rooted in something else and it popped up in a different area. So by him acknowledging that actually he was frustrated that his dad's not here was what that came down to. My next question to him was, what is it that you would want him to be doing if he was here? Let's say he could be here. What would, what would that look like? And he kind of wasn't sure what to do with that, right? It's a very um, big concept. Like I would even have to sit down and think about it. And so I said, you know what? Why don't we write him a letter? And you can write him a letter of all the things you wish he was doing or you wish he would do with you, or it's a letter of you asking the things you want him to do with you. 
you know, as if he was here. And he said, okay. And so we sat down and I wrote the letter for him and I asked him, I said, okay, what do you want me to say? And he said a list of things that he wanted him to do with him. I'll tell you, one of the things was help him walk on the ceiling. So, (laughs) so the other things were things like take him to go get treats or um, wrestle with him or read him a book and tuck him in for bed um, or sit and watch movies together and cuddle on the couch. So there are things that he is starting to see and create for himself on what a dad is and what a dad is for all of us. If you sat down, I'm sure we'd have some similarities, but most of the time it's pretty specific to the person. What you think a dad is, is probably different to what I think a dad is. So what Nash was doing is he was relating to Bob the things he wanted a dad that he thinks a dad should do. But it wasn't Bob he was wanting to necessarily do them. That's just the dad version in his head that he has. So that's what he attaches to it. So this concept is getting really like big and abstract, right? You could see why I have papers all over the place and, and you know, notes here and there. And I'm in the shower and I think of something and I try and get my phone and put notes in it. It's because what he's doing is he's creating what a dad is. And then because he has someone who was his dad, he's just inserting him into those pieces. So the next stage, and literally is what I am working on currently, is helping him understand first what those things are. What is a dad to him? What would that be? The next thing is seeing where those pieces actually are. Because the concept is, and I am... This is the one of those that pizza episode I said I was going to talk about is that those pieces don't go anywhere. What happens is different people hold them and some people hold a lot more than others. And when that person leaves our life, they don't take the pieces with them. But in our mind, we think they do because they're the ones that held them and we don't know any different. So all Nash knows is that he was born with a dad and then his dad was gone before he has any recollection of him. So as he creates what a dad should be doing or what in his eyes would make him happy, he now is just inserting Bob back into the picture. So my, bo- my job now is to help him see those things, help him see where those things are in other people and even in himself and me. Like it doesn't have to be just a male. Like if he wants someone, you know, the walking on the ceiling one, I'm gonna have to get real creative on that. But the someone to take him to go get treats or someone that would walk, he, he mentioned, um, would walk and go and get Halloween decorations. Or he was picking up things that would make him feel like he had a dad. And he's just attaching it to one person. So my job now is to help him see that that's spread out so that he can allow that energy to come in in different places. Because if he's just thinking he needs to see it in Bob, right? We know that he's not going to see that. So what my job is now is to help him shift and see where that's showing up. Because then what that does is that breaks free of that energy, that white knuckle grip he has on those pieces having to be Bob. So that means no matter who does these things, it's never going to be fulfilling if he can't start to grasp the idea that that's a piece of his dad. If someone, if he thinks a dad and wishes his dad was here to help, you know, to go take him to go get treats. So that means if someone else goes and takes him to get treats, if he understands that's an energy piece of my dad or someone who sits and watch a movie, watches a movie with him, that's an energy piece of a dad. When he starts to grasp that and see that Bob isn't this concept that he'll never feel again, it's just different people he's feeling it from. So I jumped from like when he was a baby to now, but this is kind of the everything in between. And figuring out those words, because there is a time and I have a feeling, especially this podcast coming out, that he's going to need to know and want to know and be ready to know more information. But to me, for the developmental stage he is at, knowing specifics at this stage isn't helpful to him because his brain doesn't have the next step to know what to do with them yet. But he do he does need another level of information. So that's something I'm playing with. And I'll continue to share that with you guys. As I, as that kind of evolves. Um, But I always knew that Nash was going to probably know about this much sooner than someone would traditionally say to share just because of the nature of him and how he works and how he operates. And 
how much I honor his intuition. And if he's picking up on something, the work comes in is where I have to do my work and figure out how to deliver that to him in the not even age appropriate way, but developmentally the best way that he actually can use it to his benefit. There's no way in hell I'm going to throw a bunch of information at him thinking that he needs it and then say that's going to make him feel better. That's taking an energetic feeling he's feeling inside and giving a physical band-aid to put on top of it. And we know that that doesn't ever help anything. So the tough part and the kind of work I'm doing is figuring out on how to give him the best of all of it. Give him some truths, let him settle his intuition and his feeling that there's something else he's missing about this story and also helping him, you know, evolve without this heaviness that he doesn't have the ability to shift right away like an adult would. I could help someone shift through something like suicide, right? I could help give them these tools because they have a different vocabulary. They have a different understanding. I have to work with Nash with feelings and emotions and more so, you know, like a visual learner than you would someone who can sit and just, you know, read a book and pull everything they need from it. So that's my little spiel with Nash and how that's going right now. Um, And I'll be honest, it is tough. Um, this is probably the toughest part right now. And like I said, I thought it would be the beginning. I thought it would be that, that initial time of telling him that his dad had died, but he didn't really even know what death meant at that time. So now he's starting to grasp that he's starting to see, and it's working in a different way and shifting in a different way for him to stand really strong in who he is and who we are and our family dynamic for him to see that that's fucking amazing that just because it's different and just because it's a little, you know, not the norm that that doesn't mean he's getting anything less than anyone else. So something a little bit more specific. So with a Nash question, it says curious about what you feel you'll tell Nash when he's older. Will you tell him the entire story about Bob's choices that he had been making? So anyone who's been in a divorce or separation There is this desire for some of us to not talk poorly about um, our kids, other parent for obvious reasons, right? That doesn't help them. That's not the most evolved way to do things. Um, It's just not beneficial and supportive to the long term growth and evolving of whatever a family dynamic is or for the kids. So my goal is to if. As things come up and Nash learns more truth specifically, my guess for a lot of these details, he'll for sure know them before he goes into high school. So to just touch on that, if that's kind of like the question, like if Nash will ever know or like before. So before he can look these things up himself, I will definitely make sure that he knows my guess with Nash is that he'll be asking questions before that. And it won't be something I just have to sit down and tell him. It'll be something that has come up organically. So, and it will roll out as how it's supposed to. So that is to be very upfront and honest. And I would share it in the way that I shared in this podcast, because these decisions are decisions that have been made. They're not things to be, you know, pointing the finger at, because by that point too, even as you can tell now, there are so many amazing gifts that have come from it for me to talk poorly about any of this process really isn't true because it has gotten us to where we're at. So I will be honest with Nash. I will answer questions for him. And as he gets to that point and he's closer to being an adult, right? So that high school age, I will let him know. And I will let him be, I also let him know how loved his dad was and the, the balance of his choices. And let Nash decide how he feels about that. And knowing Nash, I'm sure it is something that will probably take some processing. But like I said, I get this real strong feeling that little bits of this will evolve over the years. So by the time that he gets more specifics, he'll have already had an idea of the feeling of what was going on. And the specifics are kind of just, you know, icing on the cake. That's kind of a weird way to put it, but it's just kind of putting a little more splash of color. I think he'll have an understanding of the feeling and the dynamics of what was happening because that's how I'll probably explain it to him 
before giving him specific details. After time passed, did you ever feel like maybe there were signs that you may have just overlooked? Like, did your intimacy change? Did he not answer calls or texts? Was he private about things? So this is something that, no. So I would say, looking back, well, gosh, let me answer this in two different parts. So looking back as far as when it first happened and wondering, what did I miss? How did I not see this and that? I wouldn't say there were specific things that happened then or that during that I'd be like, oh, yep, that's when I knew that this was happening because it was cut really out of nowhere. So as I evolved and learned more, I was able to see little things on how he was acting to show me, let's say, that he was um, being hard on himself or the fact that he was um, deflecting onto me, right? Projecting his, what was going on with him onto me by disagreements or things that he would bring up or um, times that I felt disconnected from him. I'd be like, okay, that this is a time that something was going on. I could look back and kind of be like, okay, this makes sense. But in that moment, there weren't things that were going on that made me think that the, that year before, which I have explained in the episodes that year before, kind of around the time I got pregnant, things really changed. But that was pretty spot on. Like I remember even Googling things and that was pretty spot on with for some people that that was happening. Now, for me, it wasn't normal because obviously if I was Googling it like crazy and stressing about it and worrying and having all these conversations and feel like I was missing something intuitively, there was something right. And we all know that that was the case. But besides that, you know, blatant things that that last year kind of I just felt There wasn't anything that led me to believe that this was happening um, or that he was struggling or that he was dealing with anything like this. I've also said that I was always very untrusting of people, especially partners, not so much people like, you know, friends or family, but very much so partners like boyfriends. And then I would get proved right, right, by them cheating or finding out or hearing through the grapevine or all of that. So I just attributed that to my past. And I figured I was just one of those people that, you know, had been cheated on enough that I was just untrusting now. So if I didn't trust him or I had an uneasy feeling about something or he was somewhere and um, I wondered if he was like hanging out with a bunch of girls or whatever I thought, I just figured that was me. That was kind of just my go to. So it wasn't necessarily like I was like, oh, this is this is a red flag. If I feel this way, um, something's going on. It was kind of like just a constant mode of operation. So there wasn't anything that stood out, which is really a bummer. And it's a really um, I feel for people that are in this space because it is a really uncomfortable place to be in. And it's not something you intentionally do. You're really doing it from a place of trying to protect yourself and trying to prevent it from happening and pretty much trying to prevent yourself from feeling that way. So you're like grasping at straws, trying to find the thing that goes, oh yeah, you were right. So you can like relax. It's the oddest thing, but it's definitely something that looking back, I realized, but that was just how I was operating. So it wasn't necessarily specific to Bob, but the thing where it gets a little funky is like, obviously he was cheating So then you go back to, okay, well, were you picking up on it then? Then were those your signs? Were there things you overlooked? But they weren't things that I'd be like, oh, if I were to be put back in that situation as that same person, you know, I was back then, I don't know that I would have made different choices or I would have been like, oh yeah, this is that time that things changed. It really, if you think about it, based on the things that I've shared with you guys, this was happening majority of our relationship. So once we got out of college, it sounds like this sort of, you know, dynamic and outreach he was starting to do from the beginning. So I also didn't know any different. If anything felt different, I thought, okay, we moved from like college, a college town and having fun and practically an adult with training wheels. And now we're like living in this apartment together. We have bills. We have real jobs. We're trying to, we're not partying all the time. We're not as close to our friends. 
So it was kind of like, I just figured, okay, we're just figuring life out. And it's a little clumsy in the beginning. We had moved in together early. So it was, it's an interesting thing. And it, the more I explain it and the more that I look back on it, I see that it really wasn't meant to be any other way because there was no way for me to know this or get around it. It was almost like things were meant to play out exactly the way they did. I was meant to not see these things until I did because of how this was going to play out after the fact. So I hope that answers that question. But that's kind of where I was at there. As far as if did he not answer calls or texts, he was pretty good about responding. Um, I will say the only times I felt like there was some drop off or I felt like I would get this like um, kind of this more panicky or like feeling was when he would drink and when he would drink or be out with friends or when he'd be like on a work trip. And those were the times that he would tend to drop the consistencies. And that was really hard for me. But then those conversations turned into the drinking was the issue. Right. So that that changed that. So as far as everyday life, very responsive, very routine, you know, would show up, be home from work. Um, pretty much pretty consistently between four and five, he'd leave at the same time. Um, I'd be able to reach him at work. Um, his texts, like he would res- be responsive with texts. Um, yeah, he didn't travel, you know, so he was home all the time. Um, it just was really something that, um, like I said, there, it's like there's no way around it or no way of me ever really of seeing where I could have found this out any sooner. Um, the other question was, was he private about things? Not really. We kind of were each other's, you know, we had the same friends cause we grew up, you know, in college through college. So we had the same friends most of the time I, we were around each other for so long, you know, 14 years that his family and his, you know, friends from growing up were mine just as mine were his. And we shared passwords. Um, I could use his phone. It wasn't like he, you know, that there was one thing that I noticed that I remember, um, is that he would take his phone into the bathroom. Now, no one freak out. I'm not saying any person that takes their phone into the bathroom means that something's going on. Um, but what I'm saying, when I look back, that was really the only thing I could point out that was like more private. And that isn't something I would say you have a case to build around. So There really, again, wasn't a lot, weren't a lot of things that would have caught my attention, even if I were to do this over again. Now, if I was doing it over again as me today, it'd be very different. But who I was then, there really wasn't any other way for me to move through it. When you look back at your relationship with Bob, were there ever moments where you feel like he wanted to tell you or that you could tell he was keeping a secret deep down? I have to say no. There really was not a time that I felt like he was keeping things from me or that like maybe he was about to tell me something and didn't and deflected. The only thing I would say is that Bob wasn't someone who really um, liked talking about emotions in general and kind of like feelings and having big conversations. And I remember sometimes just wanting to sit and just talk. And that was just uncomfortable for him. So those things you know, looking back at those now as who I am now, that would just not fly with me. But then I didn't really, you know, I didn't really know any different. I didn't really know what I liked and what mattered to me. So I would say that was the only thing. And him having the experiences he did growing up and having his sister pass away when she was um, 17 and he was 15, you know, things, really big things that happened, he never really wanted to talk about them. And he would say he just wanted life to be back to normal. So I didn't see those as like these big red flags per se, but I did notice that it was kind of like this. um, We just don't go there kind of thing. Did you have any suspicions before all of this unfolded? No, I would have to say I didn't. I did not have suspicions. Um, If anything, I would say I felt like maybe there were moments um, that maybe he was unfaithful. And I'm saying this in like the most traumatic form, like cheating or unfaithful. Like if he didn't return a call um, and he was out drinking and I couldn't get a hold of him until later, um, or he, I had a, he had a bunch of missed calls from me or, you know, he wouldn't hear from him till the next morning. Those things would then put me on high alert. And then of course I'd get information or hear this and that, and nothing would have happened to my knowledge. So it would let it go. But it wasn't anything, anything specific. 
did the health department have to investigate and try and contact people Bob had been with? Did you have to be a part of that process at all? So no. So once I had that initial conversation, which was an in-depth conversation with that woman at the health department, there really wasn't anything else that anyone could do. There wasn't anything else I could do. There wasn't anything else they could do. Their hands were tied. I had given them all the information I had. And that's kind of pretty much besides me letting people know that reached out to me looking for Bob or that would cross my path. That was pretty much all that anyone could do um, at that point. Okay, curious about how dating has gone for you since your trust had been shattered once again. So this is, and the other part, this one kind of piggybacks on that. It says, what was your opening line on dates after that incident? How did you share? So <laughs> the funny enough, I will say the second this all happened, I was stripped to like the ground level, like studs, like we are building this thing from the ground up again. And when that happened, it kind of got rid of all of my old shit. And my old shit was all of the stuff that I've explained to you and kind of that untrusting. And it was like, all of a sudden it came to a head and it was the worst case scenario for all the things I had thought of in my head. This was like, this shattered all of that. Like this was the extreme of the extremes, right? So I, to be honest, I haven't had a problem trusting anyone ever since this all happened. And I know that seems kind of odd, but I'm going to explain it in the way that When you trust yourself, when you trust who you are and how you show up and the decisions you make and just who you are on a soul level, you start to see that life has your back, right? Not only you have your own back, but life has your back. The same concept as if I trust myself, then I trust my decisions and I trust the people I cross paths with and I trust the people I get into relationships with. And I trust my experiences because if I get into a relationship or an experience or a friendship or something where I start, if I'm thinking that I don't trust that pretty much what I'm saying, it has nothing to do with that person. It has to do with, I don't trust me because that means I don't trust myself and my higher self to have my back, that I wouldn't put myself in a situation like that. So when we get really clear on who we are and we nurture that and honor that and, you know, really stand strong in that and practice it, everything outside of us, that's not a concern of mine because I don't worry that that's not my path. That's not my journey to walk anymore. So that's something I have found that has been extremely like, I mean, it's like night and day difference. That's that's exactly why I tell people that I it was literally like an old me. And the me now are very different. And the people that kind of walked through that with me, they'll probably tell you like, yeah, she's she's different. And there's things that she's interested in and the way she does things. And but there are some things about me that are very similar. It's kind of like I got rid of that, you know, kind of the heavy layered shit that wasn't really mine, got rid of that and just built back on the foundation of who I really am at my core. And when you do that, everything else lines up. The other concept that I want to share is that when you come at it from this angle, you also aren't a match to things like someone cheating or someone lying or someone being deceitful because I've learned my lesson on how I got there. So if I can figure out how I got in that situation in the first place, how I was living my life, what I was doing, how I was thinking, how I was processing things, if I can get really clear on that and then say, okay, doing those things created this result in my life. Cool. I'm doing things completely different and I'm aligning with who I am on a soul level. So pretty much that shit can't touch me anymore. Therefore, I walk into relationships and experiences or people have access to me that honor that same thing. So I'm not going to match up with someone in a relationship that doesn't know who they are on a soul level, that doesn't value integrity, that doesn't value growth, that doesn't, you know, have this constant um, understanding of evolving. That person just isn't going to cross my path. So if we cross paths, it's for a very specific reason. And there's a lot of evolving and growth and love and nurturing and just amazing life experiences there. So that I would have to say hasn't even been an issue. I have, I can say that hands down, I've had zero issues with trusting anybody 
since that. And especially the experience I experienced, I put myself in now that doesn't mean I make decisions, you know, and most of the time my like hot spot is when it comes to Nash, if I, have you know, doing the right thing for him, making it. So I do have these kind of like little moments where I kind of play with that, but they're moments they're like, okay, am I bringing this up because it's something is my shit that I'm trying to work through? Or am I bringing this up because this is intuitively telling me that I need to point the arrow in a different direction? So it's getting really clear on those things. But other than that, um, trusting has not, it's been a non-issue. So that's been pretty exciting to see. Pretty life-changing. If I could give anyone the gift of that, doing sessions and working through that, getting really clear on who we are, even if that's not even sessions with me, like working with someone to help you get alignment in that, even if it's reading books. Even if it's learning something new, Googling, um, working with a friend, you know, whatever, writing in a journal, anything we can do to get that alignment with our soul pull, with our soul knowing and getting really clear on trusting ourselves and our intuition, that is hands down one of the best ways to never have to worry about trust again. So the other one, what, (laughs) what was your opening line on dates after the incident? How did you share? So this one, again, the dating one can, is going to be a whole episode because there's just, it's very lighthearted and funny and actually comical and outrageous also at the same time. Um, but the hard part is I didn't really have an opening line, but I will tell you that when you start dating, let's say online, online dating, someone you don't know, you've never met before. No one's introduced you, you know, nothing about this person. There's about a handful of questions everyone asks in the little message box before you even decide if you're going to call someone. And the hard part was, is a handful of those questions very quickly got out that I am not a normal person someone would be dating with a normal past, right? We all have pasts. We all have different family dynamics. I'm not the only one that has been widowed. I'm not the only one that looks, you know, the family dynamic looks different. But all the things combined was very unique is what I found. So the tough part was, is that didn't translate very well on apps because for the most part, I'm not going to say for everybody, for the most part, apps, a lot of the time are this need for connection and desire to just have this outreach with someone and communication. For me, I noticed a lot of it happened at night. You wouldn't really hear from people during the day. Sometimes you would until you started talking to them more frequently, but you would talk at night. You'd be messaging at night and you knew most people were either with their, you know, buddies out drinking, or you were at home by yourself, you know, watching TV. And this was like your form of communication and feeling like social, especially during COVID. Cause this kind of happened also during COVID where, you know, everyone took a break from dating, but when it started to like, people started to come out again, or at least start talking the apps were like on fire because you were able to connect with people and talk without any intention of going on a date, which I'll tell you a lot of the time. I don't know if that was just my experience. That was what I was finding is that a lot of people love to talk. They love to message. They love to have someone who's accessible and, and this and that and send pictures to back and forth. But the second it comes to actually going on a date, it, it changes drastically. Um, That was my experience. And I've heard that's been other people's similar experience. So with COVID dating that you ended up talking to people longer just because everyone was like cooped up at home and, and all of that. But to get back to the questions in the opening line. So after someone asks you about three questions, which is they knew I had a kid. So they'd ask about him. They'd ask if I'd been married before. You can answer those pretty basic. And then when people want to get to know you, which I'm all about, right? I'm like depth 101. I'm like, if you don't have the interest in getting to know me, then what is this? But the second they started asking more questions, it was like, I either have to cut this off or I have to be honest because I'm not about lying. And I was still figuring out what the balance was. How can I be honest and vulnerable and show you that there's this side to me without giving you everything all in the first, you know, couple of days we're messaging through the app. So with the idea of that information coming out sooner, it very quickly would get people to know that I was a widow. Well, people once are very curious 
a 34 year old why they're a widow. Okay, so there's a couple handful of things they assume that he was really sick, um, a car accident. And the second they start getting curious, which I was very open to talk about it, if you were to say, oh, I'm so sorry, I don't want to, you know, upset you. I didn't mean to ask you that question. I was not that person. If you asked me, I'd answer you. So I would get questions and I would get I would answer. And I would say he took his own life. Now, I wouldn't go into the extent of what he was doing because I felt like that is something like now we're really getting to know each other. And I had enough understanding to know that that was a lot for someone to grasp in one conversation. So I also knew in the back of my mind that the person that couldn't get that, that couldn't get this was not my person. But I also knew I wasn't on the dating app. I didn't think I would find my person right away. I mean, I might have dreamt of that being easier than it was, but it was exactly how it was supposed to be. So I got this experience on the dating apps. I would get kind of people coming in and out because they would get information, but then they'd also be intrigued. And they, the next step would be is they'd want to talk on the phone. And when we talk on the phone, it's you'd get the, the me that you're talking to and you hear talking now. So I think that threw people a little bit and being like, OK, the story with the person I'm talking to doesn't match up. She's either crazy and about to lose it or I just can't grasp what's happening here. So I got a little of that confusion. And so I would not get to a lot of first dates. I did a handful of dates and the ones that I did, I did find at the beginning, I would talk about the story. I would, they'd ask questions and I would naturally just roll out the red carpet of information. And looking back, that just makes me cringe because that it was me and it was very authentic and it was very, you know, I started dating probably at the end of the year that Bob died. So less than a year. And, but it was slow. It was like real slow. And some people would set me up with, you know, people I knew back in the day or this and that, that knew of me. And I kind of thought that was the better route to go. Cause I thought, okay, these people knew who I was like in high school. They know me. They know I'm not some, like some weirdo. Okay. So I always thought that would be more helpful and that wasn't necessarily the case. Um, and so what I did find is that most people, it was just too much. And so I started to, I would go off and on the dating apps. Like I would be on them and then I'd be like, this is so ridiculous. I'm not even authentically myself. This is draining me. I should just be studying for a class instead. Like, what am I doing? And then I'd go a couple days or a week or two and I'd be like, okay. Well, I have like a couple, you know, hours to spare and I'm just like watching TV or if the times I was like decompressing, I would, you know, go back on the apps and there'd be some people that would be intriguing and that I feel like, OK, we get each other. We have similar interests like this and that. And then it would just fizzle and it wasn't necessarily like a drop off, but there were those for sure. But it just would kind of fizzle. And then I would try different apps off and on. So as you can see. I went back and forth with those dates and also combining people that I knew from my past that seemed to be interested in those. It just nothing was clicking. And as I talk about in episode eight, that I would just start to get these feelings like I just knew that it wasn't it. And I would just instantly not be and it's not so much attracted. It's, I would say the energy I wasn't drawn in. It just I just knew the ending of the movie already. So I was like, what am I even doing? And I remember getting super frustrated about that. And I'd be like, this is so frustrating that I can't even go on a date on a pointless date and just enjoy myself because I already know that this is not it. And when I say it, like I was saying, it's it's not like I was looking for, you know, the next person to marry. It was like just someone to have fun with and that I connected with enough. And I just wasn't getting that. Like I wasn't getting the person that actually saw me, that got me, that I felt like I could be my authentic self. And I just wasn't about that. I wasn't about being with anybody or spending my time if I couldn't be me. But they, some of them did go through that process with me when I would definitely, if you want to call it oversharing, um, but share my story and then them be like, it almost like it took them some time to process it. And they'd be like, okay, like she's so, you know, in the sense like normal, like here we go. And then it'd go like to the second date. And then most of the time, I'll be honest, nothing really got past a second date. Um, nothing, actually. Um, I'm trying to think. There really isn't any of them that got past a second date at that time when I was in that phase of 
dating apps and just like trying things out and figuring out how to even do this. And I just wanted to have fun. And I don't mean like careless fun, but I just wanted to like, my life was so serious. All these things that I had gone through, I just wanted to have like some lightheartedness and I just wasn't even getting that. So to say that those, you know, opening lines were really more so me answering questions and then just rolling with it from there um, was tough. And what I saw was is that I wasn't, I didn't know if I was going to find someone who was going to understand me and let me be me, but also have enough to bring to the table that they could help me evolve as well. Cause I in no way think, you know, that I'm ever done learning or perfect or would show up to a relationship all, you know, buttoned up in the perfect bow and say, there's nothing else I have left to work on. But it was really hard for me to see that if I was ever going to find somebody who was going to be able to match that and in a different way, right. That was going to fill in the pieces that I was still working towards. And I was going to help fill in those pieces for them. And not in a, like I complete you way, but kind of like a complimenting way. And I call this a soul compliment. So someone who kind of compliments our soul in a way that we evolve together and in different areas, yet we're evolving at the same time. And I just wasn't feeling that that I was like, I don't know if anyone's going to be able to get this story. This is a big story. It's a lot of information, a lot of moving pieces. You know, it's I was like, is, is anyone going to get this? And I also this feeling that I was looking for. So I'll tell you the things that I started to realize and what dating really helped me see. It helped me see that what was important to me. It was important to me that I could be authentically me, that I didn't have to hide any part of my story. And that I was going to be with someone who I could feel could hold space for me and Nash and not and not waver, but also be that person of support and guidance if I needed it. So those were really big things. And I hadn't experienced anyone who could hold could hold that. This is a big story. And I was like, okay, maybe that's I knew I will take that back. I I knew that I wasn't going to be I wasn't meant to just be alone forever. And when I say alone, just meaning like raising Nash on my own, you know, till the end of time, I could tell there was supposed to be somebody else that was going to come in and be a piece of this with us. And, but I just couldn't figure out yet or see how I was going to get there. And the examples I was getting were showing me otherwise, but what it really was showing me is I was getting really clear on what did matter. I was getting really clear on what was important and really clear on what were non-negotiables. It was non-negotiables if someone couldn't understand my story and ran from it. So then I almost felt like there was a stage where I would just throw it all out there and be like, if you're going to run, run. And then there was a stage where I would pull things back, like on the dating apps, and I'd leave things out, like on my profile. Most of the time I always had that I was a mom because that's a big part of who I am. Doesn't mean I was showing up to dates with Nash, but It was really a big part. There's no way any conversation would get around that for more than I I couldn't I couldn't see anyone getting to know me and not knowing that part of me in some way or even brought up. So when I started to leave things off of my profile, that's when I started to realize, okay, this isn't for me. And the next stage of that was I was going to put the important things up there and I was going to be a little more reserved with how much information I gave. Not out of like manipulation, but out of, okay, let's see, I'm now going to value what I've gone through and cherish it. And it is important and it is valuable and it is not for everyone as I'm doing this podcast. It's not for everyone to get access to in that way, right? I feel like anyone who crosses paths with this podcast and chooses to subscribe and be a part of it, it's very intentional and it has this. Um, frequency to it that is nurturing and compassionate and growth oriented and just evolving. So people I was just willingly throwing out my story to and my information to, I started to change my tune with it and cherish it more and value it. So someone had to earn that right for me to be able to give them access to that. And that's where it really shifted. And I'm not going to say I got I had luck on the dating apps even after that. But what it did is it shifted my perspective and it pushed me out of those dating apps 
to where I was able to line up with opportunities and people that really were going to be that match for me. Thanks so much for being here. Please rate, like, share, and review so we can stay connected and continue this magical journey together.